Well, good morning, church. Good morning, all those watching online. As you know, we are at the verge of starting everything back at church. How many of you are excited for the fall? Yeah, so oh, that's pretty good. Awesome. That's good. Summer's not over yet, right? Woohoo. It's good to be able to, to enjoy and to, to, uh, to enjoy this beautiful sun, right? All right. Um, I, I would ask you to stand. We'll ask the Lord to come and, and speak to us today. As Father, I give you glory and honor and praises like we sang. We, we want your presence. We want the leading of your spirit. My prayer is that you would bless each person here, that you would wash over them, that you would be so real to them. Father, we, we know that you want to be personal, and, and we know that you want to get involved in our daily life, and we just open up to the reality of the Holy Spirit that wants to come and lead, empower, and be real to us. So I just pray that you would help me to communicate what you've placed on my heart. And I pray that you would bless your people dearly, uh, that you would minister to every heart. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. So we've started this series last week called At His Feet, and we'll be touching that next week. Brad will be preaching on that next week. Um, so what does it mean to be at his feet? One of the reality in life is that we, we have this spiritual component and sometimes what we do or what we believe or what we think is that life is just physical. Like you've got numbers to crunch, you've got bills to pay, you've got things to do, people to hire, uh, things that are ahead of, of you and things that you're called to do. And we know that life is very busy. And sometimes one of the things that we forget is that there's a need for us um, spiritually because we have this spiritual, uh, uh, this spiritual component in our, in our lives. And, and I shared about that last week when it came to Mary and Martha. The story goes is that Jesus arrived to the city and uh, he was invited to a house where Martha was there. And Martha invited Jesus in and she prepared a meal uh, for, for him. And, and she was working hard to prepare the best meal for, for Jesus. And Mary sat at Jesus' feet. And then Martha was upset that uh, Mary was not helping her. And Jesus said this phrase. He says, the, uh, there's only one thing worth being concerned about, Martha. Mary has discovered it. And Mary discovered was what was the most important thing. And what she discovered was that if you deal with the spiritual, the physical, and the things that happens around us will be done, will be handled a lot easier. And, and what, what Jesus was saying about Mary is that she's discovered the foundation of the most important thing when it comes to life. And we, not, we can't forget that we're spiritual beings. And, and the thought that we are spiritual changes the way that we do life because if you only think that you're physical then you don't care about the spiritual aspect in your life but the reality is that we're spiritual so our desire our calling it's to experience Jesus and, and in our mission, mission statement we say that we're called to experience God and, and, and so it's very important for us as we face the fall to realize that if we want to do what we're called to do we got to realize that it has to start in the spiritual and I believe this is where God wants to move and this is what God wants to take um, us to where we experience him on a personal level. And, and you know when you've tasted him, you know when you've encountered him how much it changes your life. And the danger for us is to do life like Martha did where she was busy doing things for God but she did not tap into the reality that Jesus was there and Jesus wanted to influence her. So the thought we shared was everything starts in the spiritual. Even though we don't see it, it's so important. And that's what I want to convey to you. What we want to be is for sure we want to do life in the physical, but we can't do life forgetting the spiritual. So I'd like to talk about another uh, per, uh, person in the Bible that went to Jesus um, when it came to his needs and when it came to his daughter's needs. And take a look at Luke chapter 8, verse 40. It says... Now when Jesus returned, a crowd welcomed him, and they were all expecting him. Then a man named Jairus, a ruler of a synagogue, came and fell at Jesus' feet, pleading him to come to his house, because his only daughter, a girl about 12, was dying. 
And then if you look at verse 49, between verse 42 and 49, there's a story of this lady that was sick for 12 years and she had spent all her money because she had a blood issue and she was considered impure. And the story goes is that Jesus was passing by. She made a way. She touched the garment of Jesus. There was virtue that came out of Jesus. And Peter said, and Jesus said, who touched me? And Peter said, well, there's a ton of people touching you. And I look at the crowd that's following you. And he said, well, no, someone touched me. She had touched Jesus differently. And we see her also finding herself at the feet of Jesus and being healed. So this is a story. Uh, this is where the story of Jairus is paused to give, uh, to give place to the story of this lady with the blood issue. And then it jumps to verse 49. While Jesus was still speaking about this matter, about this lady, uh, someone came to the house of, from the house of Jairus, this, the synagogue uh, ruler. Your daughter is dead, he said. Don't bother the teacher anymore. Hearing this, Jesus said to Jairus, don't be afraid, just believe. And she'll be healed. When he arrived at the house of Jairus, he did not let anyone go in with him except Peter, John, and James, and the child's father and mother. Meanwhile, all the people were wailing and, and mourning for her. And, and Jesus says, stop wailing. She's not dead. She's asleep. Uh, they laughed at him, knowing that she was dead. But he took her by the hand and said, my child, get up. Her spirit returned, and at once she stood up. Then Jesus told them to give her something to eat, and her parents were astonished, um, but he ordered them not to tell anyone what has happened. Beautiful story of this man that came to Jesus. And that's what the spirit of the message this morning is that I believe that we're called to come to Jesus for other people. And he came for his daughter. There's another story that is parallel to this that looks the same. It's the story of a father that had a son that was demon-possessed. And there was no solution for his situation. So he went to Jesus. He went to the feet of Jesus. And he asked Jesus to, to heal his, his son. So I'd like to talk about this morning. I'll talk, focus more on that later on. But the need for us to come to God or to approach Jesus' feet in the name of others. When it comes to life, when it comes to church, when it comes to business, we all create a culture. Um, in a church, we want to create a culture of worship. And this is why we have worship here. And this is why we have worship in everything that we do because we believe that we're called to worship. So we want to create a, a culture and an environment where worship is because we believe our calling is first to worship God. We also want to create a, a culture of generosity, of forgiveness, hospital, hospitability, where people come and, and they feel welcome. So, so when it comes to church, we, we, we want to create some, we want to create a, 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 a godly culture or a godly environment. And I, I believe that's normal. That's what we're called to do. And when it comes to life, we also, when it comes to our homes, we also create a culture. You can create a culture in your home where you celebrate each other, where verbally you blast each other, where you say to each other, I love you. And then the kids grow up and it's easy for them to say, I love you. And, and, and so when it comes to culture, um, we create it. For example, you can create an environment in your home where forgiveness is central, where there's no place for resentment and unforgiveness, where you make sure that, uh, that the culture is celebrated or respected where uh, forgiveness is found. So when it comes, like I'm repeating myself, but when it comes to culture, we create it. And so we want to create a godly culture. And one of the aspects that we want to have in our lives, coming back to prayer, is that we want to create a culture, an environment, a climate where prayer is central. I really believe this is something that we're called to, to make happen. Like God wants to reveal himself, but it's between me and you. It's, it's up to us if we want to pray or not, or if we want to connect with God or, or not. And, and so we, we want to be a people that, that, are, um, that celebrates this climate of prayer. I, I like what it says in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 16. Just think about this verse, how powerful it is. Let us, let us then approach the throne of grace. Can you say to your neighbor, you can approach the throne of grace. Can you do that? Let us then approach the throne of grace. Think about that for, for a moment. I can approach God. And if you look at the verses that 
precedes this, talks about Jesus made a way. So I can approach God. I can approach the throne of grace. I can draw close to him. I can connect with him. And that's, this is the exhortation that we find in this verse, that we're called to approach the throne of grace with confidence. Can you say to your neighbor, with confidence, with assurance because of what Jesus did, so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our times of need. Help us in our times of need, is found where? In the th at the throne of grace where we can approach freely. I think it's pretty powerful, right? So I don't want to live my life without that spiritual component. For sure there's things to do. For sure there's numbers to crunch. For sure there's things to, to take care of. But I don't want to walk away or think or believe that it only stops there. I need to realize that I'm called to be at his feet. I'm called to experience him in my life. I'm called to seek after him. I, I, want, to, I want to discover that like Mary did. Where, oh yeah, that is an important factor in my life. I need to grow spiritually. I'm a spiritual being that needs to be fueled and renewed. And that happens when I'm at his feet, right? So we want to see that in our lives. So we're called to create a culture where we go to God in prayer. Jairus turned to Jesus in his time of need. The culture that we want is a culture that we say, let's pray. A culture that we say, okay, let's pray. Doesn't matter what you deal, you're dealing with, you take the time to pray. Imagine if you raise your kids with this, this, uh, this culture or this approach where things are not stable, like things are not stable. You know, li life is not a straight line. There's always some issues. But you teach them to, let's pray. Let's, let's hold hands. Let's turn to God. Let's seek his face. Let's ask God what he's up to. And, and so, so that's the invitation I believe God is giving us. And so when you do this, you're looking at life more than in a physical way or more, more than just you coming up with your own conclusion and your own ideas. It's okay. We have experiences and we grow in knowledge, but we always have to realize that that's not enough. We need to have God's input in our lives. When it's a business deal, when it's raising your kids, whatever it might be, God, what do you have to say? What do you want to do? What's your input? What What's your heart in this matter? So it's very important for us to live like this because that is contagious. And if you're a parent, if you're a person of influence, as we all are, would it be awesome if all of us, we would have this approach, let us pray, right? It doesn't say, let us panic. Let us freak out. Let us slander. Let us criticize. Let us pray. I think that's what we need to know. We, we need to realize that we're invited to come at the feet of Jesus. And as, listen to this, as you take care of the spiritual, the physical will come in play. You see? If you realize that life is not vis only visible, but also spiritual, and you understand that, and you discover it like Mary did, it's going to influence a lot your physical, influence a lot what you do. So what we want to be is a people that says... Let's pray. You think about the story of Peter. He's in prison. And times were tough and rough. And they were doing, they were doing like an awesome job of seeing the gospel being sp spread. And the gospel went out. But then Peter is in prison. What did the church do? Let us pray. And the story goes that an angel came and set Peter free. And Peter found himself at the house uh, where they were all praying and they were freaking out. <laughs> it's kind of funny, right? They're praying for a breakthrough, but they're not really expecting one. But God hears and God sees and God has a plan. But I think that that was a great teaching for the early church. What do you do at first? You pray. You go to God. You bring it to God. Did you know that when you stop praying, God is still moving? You might be praying and you might sense his presence. Oh, it was so good. It doesn't stop there. God continues on. There's, there's, a, there's a trail that follows prayer. It's God's activity. There's a trail that follows prayer, and that's God's activity. It's pretty cool, right? So you go on your knees and you pray and you seek the Lord's face. It doesn't stop there. There's, a, there's something that is on the, on the move. Something is being moved. So you walk in faith, believing that God will do something in this matter. 
Look what it says in James chapter 5, verse 13. Is any of you in trouble? Oh, you should pray. <laughs> you, you got trouble? Pray. Anyone happy? Let him sing songs of praise. Any one of you sick? Well, he should call the elder of the church to pray over him and anoint him with oil in the name of the Lord. See, it turns to God. Always turns to God. You're in, a tr in trouble? You turn to God. You're, you're happy? Things are awesome? You turn to God. You have a situation and you need people around you to turn to God with you. It's all about turning to God. It's all about turning to God. And we see this often. Because we live in the Western world, we don't need to turn to God. And we don't. And we miss out on God's intervention and God's grace. So it's important for us to realize that sitting at the feet of Jesus is the best part like Mary did. Okay? And when we take a hold of this, it changes the way we do life. Look what it says in James chapter 5, verse 16, a little lower. The prayer of a righteous man is powerful and effective. Powerful and effective. Can you say that to your neighbor? Powerful and effective is the prayer of the righteous man. Powerful and effective. Big words. Powerful. It doesn't say weak. It doesn't say unheard by God. It says that it's powerful and effective. I got to believe that when I go before God and I go to his feet, Something happens, and then James gives this illustration, example of Elijah. Elijah was a man just like us. He prayed earnestly that it would not rain, and did not rain on the land for three years and a half. Again, he prayed, and the heaven gave rain, and the earth produced its crops. Like, and he's saying here that Eli Elijah was a man like us, that you are like Elijah. So what are we learning from this? Is that you turn to God. You come to his feet. You bring your requests to him. You expect him to intervene. So what do we do first is we're quick to pray. Amen? So with me, we're, we're quick to pray. Can we let that absorb our, can we absorb this in our heart? Be quick to pray. Because there's a lot of challenges, a lot of, Question marks, right? What is before us? What do we know? God knows. So what, what do we do is we go to God. Secondly, we need a culture that we press in. We need a culture that we press in. We ask and seek and knock and we press in. So it's not just to pray, but to Press in. Say that to your neighbor. Press in. We got to press in. You got to get closer. You got to battle. The reality is that we don't fly, we don't fight against flesh and blood. The reality, there's a battle going on. So then we pray, and as we pray, we realize that we have to press in. So we ask, we seek. And we knock. The process is here. You ask, you seek, you knock. And then you don't quit, right? And we find that in Colossians chapter 4, verse 2. Paul is talking to the church and he says, continue steadfastly in prayer. Don't stop praying. Don't give up in prayer. Being watchful in it with thanksgiving. At the same time, pray also for us that God may open us the door uh, for, the, for the word to declare the mystery of Christ um, on account of which I'm in prison. Saying I'm in prison because of the word, but what we want to see is the word being preached everywhere. So he says, continue steadfast, steadfastly in prayer. So we need to do that. So we're, we need to realize that there's a spiritual battle, and we need to realize, and I want, your I want to have your attention here because... This, this is kind of a, a major point I want to share to you, is that when it comes to prayer, there's groundwork that needs to be done. So let's say, you're, let's say I give you an example that you want to see an, awaken, an awakening over our land. How many of you, you would like to see an awakening over our nation? All of us, right? Where God would move, where people would turn to God, and people would ex accept God and, and be on fire for God. But to see that happen, there's steps that need to be taken, when it comes to persevering in prayer, it's like peeling an onion. There's some layers. There's a process. And sometimes we, we forget that when we pray for someone or we pray for something, that sometimes there's a need to see things be dismantled before they're rebuilt. 
So for example, if you want to see an awakening in our nation, well, there might be some, might be, there might be some layers that needs to be removed first. First would be the heart of the church where we are passionate for God and wanting God to show up, a heart for the lost. And, and so, so there's a process that happens, right? So when it comes to prayer, some prayer, sometimes we pray once and we don't realize that there's a battle going on and we don't realize that there needs to be layers removed. Let's say you pray for, for a family that have walked away from the Lord. Well, the thing is, at one point, they probably took some bad decision and, and, what, and, and, and wrong curves. So what happened is that God has to come and remove a layer, remove another layer, remove another layer. And sometimes we think that he's not answering, he's not moving, but all this time he's removing layers. It's the same thing with us. I've got some layers that needs to be removed, right? I need you to pray for me because there's layers that needs to be removed. It's the same thing with you. And sometimes we get discouraged because we don't understand the process of the journey. Layers needs to be removed. For example, you're praying for, um, for people at your work that do not know the Lord. And you say, well, I prayed, I witnessed once. And then you say, I don't want nothing about the Lord. Did you realize that there's layers Come on. Did you realize there's layers over Winkler, over Morden, over Altona, Carmen, this region? There's layers over our nation. There's layers over, over the church. So sometimes we pray for a quick fix. Ah, he doesn't answer. Yeah, he's working in the background, removing layers. You know, you're praying at your, for your marriage and, and you give it a go for a while and then you say, well, it's not working. And then you start to look on the other side of the fence. You block your heart up. You endure your heart. And you say, God is not faithful. Did you realize that there might be layers that need to be removed? And God does that. God softens the hearts. God works in the back scene. So that's why we persevere. Because we know that God is at work, but I got also to endure and be patient, realizing that there's layers that need to be removed. I'm going to tell you that. When you get that, you, 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 you have more joy in your prayer. When you get that, you persevere because you know that it's a process. It's not always an event. It would be awesome if God would answer all our prayers overnight. And God can do the supernatural and do the miraculous because he is God. At the same time, he wants to change hearts. You know how we came to the Lord as a family? Like we were having fun. Life was good. Nobody was sick. Nobody was like, you know, it was party and party and it was just life was great. And, but the thing is, we were hard to, to the gospel. We didn't want to have the gospel because life was good. Why do I need God, right? And I remember, and I shared the story in the past, but this lady, I remember seeing her at that time, that's many years ago. I was about a preacher of 30 years old, and, and I went to preach in northern Quebec, and this lady was 80-some years old, all wrinkled, arthritis in her hands, and she has tears in, on, on her face, and she said, a little laney that is preaching the gospel. It's a miracle. It's a miracle. And she was crying. You know, she prayed all these years because there was a layer, layers, layers, layers around the laneys. You see, someone prayed. Someone stood in the gap. God removed the layer. God remove a later and supernaturally somehow at some place God showed up and we were open because there was a, a need to see things being broken down and removed. You see? Phenomenal. For her, I don't know how long it took, but we were on a prayer list for decades. Maybe we were a thick onion. <laughs> we had a lot of layers, right? But realize that prayer remove layers. Remember that this morning. Prayers removes layers. Prayer remove layers. And if we don't get that, then we don't persevere. When we're, when we're always focused on the major victory and we don't rejoice over the small victories, you see, we want to see the big breakthrough, right? We want to see our nation come to the Lord. But there's a journey God is peeling, changing, setting us up for the major breakthrough that will happen one day, but there needs to be some peeling that needs to happen. You still with me? 
So that's why we persevere in prayer because of, of the layers. Thirdly, we need to create a culture of intercession where we stand in the gap for others. That's really the heart of what I wanted to say today. This, this man, it was close to him. It was his, his daughter. There's nothing as close as, as, as your kids, right? But he went to Jesus in the name of her daughter, and he was at the feet of Jesus. Even though he was a religious leader, even though people were going to talk, even though his reputation as a religious leader would be compromised, he went at the feet of Jesus for his daughter. He went at the feet of Jesus for his daughter. He stood in the gap. And I think that's one of the calling that we have as fathers, as mothers, as uncle, and as boss, or as co-workers. Our goal, our calling is to stand in the gap. Not to judge, not to criticize, not to point the finger and if he would do what I do, then he would be fine. But you stand in the gap and you do like Daniel did in Babylon when he looked at Jerusalem every three times a day and he prayed for Jerusalem and he said, forgive our sins, Lord. We've sinned against you. He didn't say forgive their sins. He said, forgive our sins. He stood in the gap in the name of the people. And that's what we need to do we got to stand in the gap for other people. Do you have any loved ones that do not know the Lord? Or you got loved ones that are lukewarm and they're not passionate about God? Or they're caught in a situation and they're caught in sin or bondage? What am I called to do? Stand in their behalf. They can't do it, but I can for them. Pretty amazing, eh? So I stand in the gap for other people like this little girl. She was in bed. She could not run after Jesus, but dad could. The same thing with the, the guy that had his demon-possessed boy. He was not able to run after Jesus, but he could. So what we do is we run to God for others. That's what intercession is. You run to God. You stand in the gap for others. And you pray for the Remove, the removing of, 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 the, of, the, uh, of, of the onion thing. I forget the word right now. <laughs> Sorry? Layers. The layers. There you go. Thank you. <laughs> so we want to see that. Look what it says in Romans chapter 8, verse 26. That's the heart of God. It says, in the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. Meaning that sometimes we don't know how to pray. So we do not know what we ought to pray, but... The Spirit himself intercede for us with groans that words cannot express. What a verse. What a verse. It, here it talks about you're caught up to see a breakthrough. You're praying for someone and you're so broken inside and, and you pray like, ah, you can't pray. But this is Spirit interceding through you to see a breakthrough in the other person's life. Do, do we realize that prayer is God's platform for intervene? And so the Holy Spirit comes and play and moves us to a point where we're groaning. Actually, we are groaning, but he's groaning through us to see a breakthrough and to see someone be restored, see someone be healed, see someone come back home, someone be moved by God. So that's one of the role of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit fills us, empowers us. Uh, there's the fruit of the Spirit. There's the, the, uh, the gift of the Spirit. But there's also, listen to this, the Holy Spirit that comes in you and gives you a heart for a cause, a heart for the lost. You don't even know why you're praying, but you're on the floor, you're on your knees, you're in your car, you're bawling. You're just bawling. Your heart is just taken and it's like and sometimes you don't see that come it's just ah and this is the holy spirit that is interceding for someone else through you for a breakthrough pretty cool that's the bible that's the bible we find that in the bible romans chapter 8 verse 26 where the spirit intercedes through us through groanings for breakthrough for someone else we see Jesus intercede for, for his disciples in John chapter 17. Look what he says in John 17 verse 15. My prayer is not that you take them out of the world, but that you protect them from the evil one. They are not of this world as, even as I'm not of it. Secondly, he says, sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, I have sent them into the world. You see, Jesus standing in the gap for his disciples. He says, Father, they need to be protected. Protect them. Sanctify them. And empower them like you've empowered me. 
So he prays protection. He prays personal growth and transformation in the inside. And he prays, God, as, as you sent me, you're sending them. But protect them because I know that they have a call upon their lives, right? So it's important to realize that to come at Jesus' feet, at Jesus feet it's to intercede for other people, to fight for them. You know, there's a lot of people that they can't fight for themselves. They're caught in anxiety and fear, and they're in bondage of sin, and they're just caught. You know? Who will stand in the gap? You look in the book of Ezekiel, they're looking for someone. God is looking into the people to who, where, who will stand in the gap. He's looking at the priests. He's looking at, at the princes. Nobody will stand in the gap. He looks at the church, uh, at the temple, looks at the, those that are serving uh, at the temple. No one is standing in the gap. And I believe that we're called to stand in the gap. So I challenge you to be open to what God puts on your heart. You may have a dream of someone. You may be working with other people and something that someone says just resonates in your heart. Be open and be, um, be vulnerable. Be open and vulnerable for God to put onto, put onto your heart someone to pray for. And it might not just be a quick prayer. It might be a year prayer as the Lord leads. Okay? So we see the need for us to pray for others. Number four, a culture we expect God to show up where we wait for him to move. There's so many things that we can't change. Sometimes we, life is like a, an omelet, right? The eggs are broken, and how do you put back the eggs in the, in the shell? You just can't. And we all experience at one point omelet season, right? Do <laughs> you agree? Like you say, okay, how will this be fixed? What do we do with that? We can't go back because it's too far. What do we do? Well, this is where we turn to God. God is able to make an omelet very cool, very good. He's able to turn things that we screwed up and, and that the mistakes we've done and turn it to his glory. But that's why we pray. Because we believe that God is able to do the impossible. Look at the people that were there around Jairus. They told Jairus, don't bother the master now. Your daughter's dead. Move on. <laughs> chop, chop. But Jesus had a word in season for him. You see? It wasn't done yet until Jesus said it's done. So a lot of people say a lot of stuff, but what is God saying? And I've got to discern what God is saying. I've got to hear what he has to say because he's a speaking God. I, I look at the people that were, were uh, beaten after they preached the gospel. The disciples, when they preached the gospel, they were beaten by the religious leader. And they, they came together in Acts chapter 4, verse 29. It says, and now the Lord... Now, sorry, and now, O oh Lord, hear their threats and give us, your servant, great boldness in preaching your word. Stretch out your hand with healing power. May miraculous signs and wonders be done through the name of your holy son, Jesus. They don't give up. They expect God to do the impossible. Even though it seems to be impossible, they're, they're, a, they're, they're called a cult. Uh, and, and there you, you have this ocean of Judaism. And so how do you pierce through? God can I, I need to realize that I can approach God that can do the impossible. So I approach God, I approach God in faith, but I also trust in his character. When you approach God and you pray, you have to remember who he is. That he has attributes, that he can do all things, but he's also father. And, and so, so the way uh, my self-identity, it's huge when it comes to prayer. I can approach God as a son. And you can approach God as a son or a daughter. So you approach God and you bring your requests to him, knowing that he's your daddy. Can you say to your neighbor that God is my daddy? God is my daddy. It's huge. He's going to take care of us. And I know that some of us, when it comes to fatherhood, we haven't had a good example. But you can discover God in prayer in such a way that you will see him as your father, as you, uh, as you go through the word and you discover that he's Abba, changes everything, right? So I approach God as Abba, and I approach God as a son or a daughter, but I have also to realize that as I approach, listen to this, as I approach God as a daughter or a son, I also approach God knowing that I have a call. Jesus was in Zethsemane, and he was a son that was loved by father. And he said, Father, can you remove this cup? I don't want to drink it. If 
Finally, he said, not my will, but your will be done. Being a son or being a daughter doesn't put into check the call that you have. Sometimes because of the call, you'll go through suffering. But it doesn't put in jeopardy your calling as a son or daughter. But to think that your daughter and the son and everything will be peachy, it's to, it's to forget the call. So it's not a competition between the call and your identity as a son or a daughter, but it's to realize that when you became a son and a daughter of the Most High, there's also a call that was placed on you. And in that call, there might be suffering and challenges, realizing that whatever you go through, God has a purpose and God has a plan, even though it doesn't make any sense. But you're secure in the fact that you know that you're loved, but you're also aware that you have a call. Some people, they only focus on their identity as son and daughter, and they forget they have a call. So they think that God will do everything for them, and they're going to live forever and ever on the earth. Well, it's not going to happen. We're all going to die. We all go through suffering. We all go through trials. But we know that we have a call. So through that, we know that God empowers us to reach people and to fulfill our call. Still with me? So it's huge, right? So I need to realize that when I approach God, I expect Him to move. So my last thought here this morning. What happens when you encounter Jesus? Well, you will have a word in season. Look what... Jesus said to Jairus, don't be afraid, just believe, she will be healed. So what does Jesus want to tell me when I go through seasons in life? There's some seasons, well, Jesus has a word for every season. He has a word for, uh, he, has a, a, he has a word in season for me and you. Sometimes it's going to be a word of faith. He's going to tell us, don't quit, stand up, have faith. And the promises. Sometimes there's going to be a word of patience. He's going to come and say, wait, trust me. It's going to take a while to see a breakthrough. Sometimes it's going to be a word of encouragement. Don't give up. Don't give up. Sometimes it's going to be a word of comfort because we went through a great loss. And say, my son, I know you went through a hard time. I'm sorry for your loss. And he heals us and he helps us to move forward. The reality is that God is a speaking God. And so we want to draw close to him knowing he speaks to us. So what I want to convey to you as I, I wrap up this message is that we have to be a people that comes to his feet for our own self, but also for the sake of others. We've got to realize that we are spiritual beings that need a spiritual intervention. And when the spirituality is met, when we are a spiritual people relying to God, it will affect and influence the physical and where we live and how we live. So my prayer this morning is that as you leave this place, that you would, yeah, live as human beings on this earth that is physical, but that you would realize that you're also a spiritual being and that you need God in your life and that he wants to be close to you. And secondly, that you're called to stand in the gap for others. You're called to intercede and you're called to peel onions and not to quit and believe that God will make a way even where there seems to be no way. Amen, I would ask you to stand. Thank you for listening. Father, we, we want to be a people of your presence. We want to be a people that goes to your feet. We want to be quick to go to you. I just pray that you would bring a revelation in every heart here that they are spiritual beings, not just physical, that they need to see that spiritual reality be met by you. We don't want to run to the right and to the left. We want to learn to run to you. We want to create a culture where we turn to you in our lives, in our family, but also in our church. Wherever we are, Lord, we want to be quick to pray. Father, I just sense you want to encourage people here that have prayed and, and haven't realized that there, were, there are layers. I just, I, I just sent God is, wants to say to some of you, don't quit, persevere. When you pray for a loved one, when you, you pray for a breakthrough, realize that God is at work removing layers after layers. There's groundwork that needs to be done. So I just sense God saying, be encouraged. And there's some of us that we do life in the natural. We crunch numbers, we, we take care of business, and we're good at it. But we're spiritually dead. 
We are. We're running here, we're running there. We haven't discovered what Mary discovered, to sit at Jesus' feet and realize that life comes from the presence of God that enables me to do life according to His ways. So if that's you, I invite you to say, Jesus, be real in my life. Like we sang, blow by your Spirit upon my life. And maybe you're here this morning and you came with a family member or you came but you're spiritually dead. Like you are distant. You're caught in sin. You are totally hard. You're hurt. You're hurting badly. You know, Jesus wants in in your life. And if you dare opening the door, it's going to be amazing what he's going to do. It's going to be a journey of freedom, a journey of healing. As I'm saying this, I just hear in my spirit the same thing when it comes to marriages, when you are kind of not, when things are not working and you're discouraged when it comes to your marriage, you want to throw the towel, I just pray for a tender heart. I pray for a heart that is tender to the situation, not a hard heart. And only God can do that. So I just pray, God, that you would breathe upon your church to, with new life, with a new beginning, with a hope and expectation. But wherever you are, a teenager going through life with a lot of decisions to make, know that the feet of Jesus is a place to go. Maybe you're retired and you say, what, what am I called to do with my body? You can stand in the gap for others and pray and love on, on, uh, on others. And my prayer, Father, is that we know we can approach you with boldness, bold, boldness and assurance, but at the same time realizing that we have a calling and you have a plan for us, a plan that you want to fulfill through us. So bless your people, Lord. And just pray, Father, that you would work in our lives. Just pray for a fresh move of your spirit, that we might be a people of your presence, that we would be eager to go to your feet and to seek your face. In Jesus' name, amen. I have this thirst Only you can satisfy My heart it burns With an all-consuming fire I search and seek For your name heart and but there's something heavy there we invite you to go to the prayer there's someone there i'd love to minister to you other than that let's pursue god this week amen blessings have an amazing amazing week